So this is just going to yeah I still talk about uh, the, the your homework for a moment uh, sometimes I assign problems that um, where or problems that I didn't quite go over in class. So really, I just want you guys to, you know, handle the problems that you can't handle. And if you don't recognize the problem, at least try to attempt it. Uh, the solutions uh, should be it should be to find the uh, odd number of problems through CalChat. And usually, I work out the even number of problems um, in my uh, in my link under on my website for that day. Um, but if we didn't go over that problem and you're struggling with it, just try your best because. Um, I'm, I'll, if it's important, I'll come back and I'll um, work through those concepts and work through those problems uh, leading up to the test. Um, but um, going into the quiz, I'm going to let you know exactly what's going to be on the quiz. Okay, so we'll do a quiz review. So uh, no surprises. Okay, so I'll, you, you'll know exactly what's going to be on the quiz, and you will be practicing what's going to be on the quiz. Okay, so if you, sometimes if you see some problems that um, and you're stressed about. Now you don't know how to do that problem. You know, try your best, and if it's important, I'll come back and I'll revisit those problems with you. Okay. All right. So um, today we're going to talk, start talking about algebraic limits. Um, in your homework, you may have seen those algebraic expressions, and you're relying completely on the graph, which is what I want you to do, right? Because all we know right now is how to find limits using a graph. We don't know how to find limits using the algebraic expression, but today we're going to learn how begin learn how to do that. I hope to uh, uh, get a little bit into tomorrow's uh, lesson, which is more algebraic limit, and that way we can uh, just uh, have some more time to kind of process those algebraic steps. Uh, hopefully, we can start with you tomorrow, kind of, and then uh, Thursday uh, review and Friday quiz. Okay. Uh, okay. So let's uh, move into. Today's lesson, if you guys can go to page five. Okay, let me go over these rules. Um, these rules may seem kind of um, kind of abstract right now, but um, uh, we'll look at uh, full examples down, down the road. Okay. The limit of B as X approaches C, all this is saying is that if I have a constant, let's say that constant is 5 or 8 or 10, that constant is basically like a horizontal line. And it doesn't matter where I am on that graph. My graph is always going to hold that Y value no matter what. Okay. Um, okay. The second here is just saying that um, the limit as x approaches c of f of x, if the limit is equal to some number, then any coefficient in front is just going to tag along. So if my limit is 10 or limit is 15, then if I multiply that number on the left side, that number is also going to get applied to the right side. So all I'm saying is, you know, a lot of times we just treat it like any multiplication step. OK, so really uh, the first big concept here is direct substitution. So to find limits for a function, we're going to treat it like as if we are evaluating an expression of a function. We're just going to plug that argument in. Directly into the expression. 
So pretend like as if we're just finding an ordered pair on the graph. And if the resulting value is a real number, then the value is the limit. Meaning that if my function doesn't have a hole or a break or asymptote or hole, then finding a limit is going to feel the exact same as finding an ordered pair on the graph. Okay. There's not going to be any distinction. So pretend like your function is x squared plus 3x and you're just finding f of 2. So, and that is, uh, now it sounds straightforward and it is, but this foundational step, sometimes we want to skip over as problems get more complex. So I want to kind of lay that foundation that no matter what the limit problem is, no matter um, um, what the steps would require later on, we don't want to skip the first step. First step is always evaluate the expression and see what it gives you. OK, so let's insert two in for X. And what do we get? Ten's a real number, so that's my limit. And my order pair is also 10. So we're going to talk about this next week. If your order pair and your limit all lines up, that means your graph is it's connected through that point. There's no hole, there's no break, there's no asymptote. Okay. And if we get a real number, then we stop. There's nothing more to do. That's our answer. All right, part B. Limit. As x approaches two of five, is there a variable for us to plug in? No. So that five is not going to change. Right? That five is going to stay five the whole way through. So here, imagine you have a horizontal line y equals five. If x is two, my y is still five. That horizontal line, that y value is never changing throughout the entire problem. Okay, but it's a continuous function, so we're able to get a real number there as well. All right, try part C. And you're three minus two minus seven plus four. All right, what do we get? Negative eight. Okay, that's a real number, so that's our answer. Part D. Insert I in for X. You guys recall unit circle values? What's cosine of pi? What's cosine of uh, Close. Negative one, yeah. So pi times negative one is negative pi. Yeah. yeah, eventually we're gonna have to um, uh, recall unit circle values, but that's going to be later on the semester. We'll we'll uh, review that when we need to. Okay. okay, so the first step is plugging the value. Right? It doesn't mean that we're always going to get real numbers. Okay, in fact, we're going to see some problems where, you know, what if there's a hole? Um, how are we going to get that? How are we going to get the limit? So that's our next thing. But the the importance of of what we saw from A through D is that is our first step. Even if we think that it's not going to work, we always want to evaluate the expression because this is the information gathering stage. Okay, we, we are, we're trying to do this without the graph, so we have to kind of rely on information that we can get from uh, from the step. Okay, so um, not all limits will be as easy as this. It's not just plugging in and finding the value. Um, so. What if we have problems that require more steps? And this is the simplify reduction method, okay? where we factor, we simplify, and we substitute. So um, 
we're always going to evaluate the argument first, just like how we did for A through D. But what if we go? What if we don't get a real number? What if we get something that is in this form? Zero over zero. Now zero over zero. If we get zero over zero, that means that the point doesn't exist, but the limit does exist. Because when you see that zero over zero, what that means is that visually, I want you to picture this: that there is a hole in the graph. And it's going to look something like this. Maybe. Okay. I don't know. Okay, not talking about the branch, but I'm just talking about the fact that the hole is going to be um, the only thing that's preventing the graph from being continuous. So what's happening is that if you see zero over zero, you know that visually the point may not exist, but the limit does, right? Because if we see a graph like this, we know we can pick two points on either side of the graph. And the two arrows are going to head towards the same destination. But the challenge here is we're trying to do all this without the use of a graph. Okay. So if we see zero over zero, that does not mean that limit does is undefined. It means that a problem is incomplete and unfinished, and we have a little bit more, we have a ways to go to get to our answer. But we do know that a real number answer is waiting for us. We just have to get there. So how do we get there? We know there's a hole in the graph. We're going to factor, reduce, and simplify. And the reason that we want to factor and reduce is because we're trying to find in the expression what is causing that roadblock, what is causing that zero over zero. We're going to identify those factors, take them out, and then reevaluate. If we do that, algebraically, we're going to be able to reach the limit that is uh, true for the graph. OK, so we're going to factor, reduce, simplify. Then once we find common factors, we'll cancel that, cancel that out. We'll, uh, we'll get down to the reduced expression. And then we're going to basically treat it like a new problem. We're going to reevaluate the limit. We're going to reinsert the, exp uh, the x value into the reduced expression. And we should arrive at a real number. We're looking, if we see 0 over 0, we know that we're working towards a real number. Um, that is the that is going to be the limit for our problem. OK, so let me show you what that looks like um, now that we've gone through the, the steps. OK, limit as x approaches negative 2 of x squared plus 5x plus 6 all over x plus 2. OK, first things first, we don't want to assume anything. We want to insert the x value into the expression and let's see what we get. Okay, Are we getting a real number or are we getting something else? We're getting something else, we want to be able to know how to interpret it. Okay, so negative two and for all the x's. Okay, what does the numerator give us? Zero, okay. What does the denominator give us? Zero. Zero, okay. So this is visually we want to understand. We want to understand that this is not saying that the limit doesn't exist. This is saying that the limit does exist. We just haven't found it yet. Okay. You know, there's a hole in the graph, and I want you guys to to visualize that. There's a hole in the graph, and there's something preventing us from seeing what the true limit is. So. We get zero over zero. We're going to look for some common factors. We're going to try to find something that matches between numerator and denominator that we can remove. OK. If you look at the numerator, well, if you look at the denominator, there's nothing that we can do with the denominator, right? That x plus 2 is already as reduced as we can go. But the numerator is what we can work with. Okay. Numerator is factorable. So we ask ourselves, what well, multiplies to be a times c, which is one times six, is six, and adds up to be that middle number, that b value. Three and two. Okay, so we have our factors, and we're going to get that numerator into factored form. See what happens. All right. Do you see matching factors between numerator and denominator? 
Okay. Yes. So this is the cause of the hole. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove the hole. Once we remove the hole, we're able to get to a reduced expression. So basically, this is going to look exactly like the original graph. And it just has to hole removed. The hole is removed. We can insert and actually find out where the hole was, which is going to be where the limit is. So once we reduce, we're going to reevaluate the limit. So now we have a new problem to evaluate. So replace x with negative two, and what do we arrive at? Uh, positive one. Now, if the graph was in front of us, we could just pick two points, draw two arrows, and figure out that is one. But we're arriving at the same conclusion without the use of a graph and using these uh, algebraic steps. Right. Any questions? So this is going to be the big picture that we're going to be working on today and tomorrow. The factors are going to, the, the problems are going to be more and more complex. But the big picture is the same. We're trying to find, if we get zero over zero, ultimately we're trying to find something that we can remove between numerator and denominator, and we can take it, take it out, which will remove that zero over zero. And if we reevaluate, we're always trying to get down to a real number. Okay. okay, let's look at part B together and see how this is going to look a little different. All right, first things first. What's the first step always? Yeah, plug in the one. OK. Uh, the, the temptation that we're going to have is sometimes we look at a problem and we feel like, OK, that's factor. I'm just going to go to that step. OK, don't skip to that second step. Always take the time to plug in because um, it's going to give us it's going to give you a lot of useful information that's going to help you decide what the second step is. Okay, so don't skip that first step. Okay, so insert one in for x. Okay, and what do we get? 12 over, over zero. zero. Okay, this is not the same thing as zero over zero. Okay, if you see zero over zero, that means there's a hole in the graph. If there's a 12 over zero, does anyone know what's happening at one? Fine. Okay, good, undefined, but visually, do you know? Asymptote. Good, there's a vertical asymptote there. Okay, there's a vertical asymptote. At X equals one. Basically, this is saying that there is a factor in the denominator where the numerator is not able to match and take away. So if there is a factor in the denominator that does not cancel out, that is part of a vertical asymptote. If there's a vertical asymptote, we learned yesterday, that means the limit what? Not exist. Now, at this point, we don't know how the branches are behaving, right? Maybe they're both going up. Maybe one's going up, one's going down. Maybe they're both going down. We don't know the behavior of this um, of the of the graph around the asymptote. We'll discover that next week. But as of right now, we know there is an asymptote. The graph is headed towards that asymptote. We don't know which direction, but at the very least, we know the limit doesn't exist. So, big distinction between zero over zero and twelve over zero. Right? Zero over zero means keep going. We haven't reached the end yet. If you get 12 over 0 or 9 over 0 or 5 over 0, that means go ahead and stop. The limit doesn't exist. Um, okay. We're going to do a little bit more with this a little bit later, but for now, big picture is the limit doesn't exist. And uh, further details uh, we're going to discover next week. All right, next page. Before we move on to the next, next example, I want to um, have you guys copy this now.
sometimes uh, zeros can be confusing because when you see zero, it, they don't all mean the same thing. The location of the zeros is really going to tell you something different about what's going on. So I want to kind of spell out um, these different variations so that depending on where the zero is, that's going to give you a visual idea as to what's happening with the graph. Okay, so first step is, first thing is, if you see zero over zero, you want to have a picture in your mind. There's a hole in the graph, the limit exists, I need to keep working. Okay. There's a real number waiting for me at the end of this problem. If you get 12 over zero, or five over zero, or negative 10 over zero, you know there's a vertical asymptote, you know the full limit doesn't exist. Okay. We're going to expand on that a little further, but the big picture is that you know there's a vertical asymptote and the limit doesn't exist. Okay. And finally, if you get a zero over a non-zero, let's say zero over four, or zero over negative two, or zero over three, that's a real number. Okay. That is zero. So they all look kind of similar, right? But they have very different implications on what it means for our graph. Okay, try part C. Go through, go through our go through your steps and see if you can take the information that the problem gives you after you insert the X value. And then from there, decide what to do, right? If you get a real number, you're done. If you get zero over zero, factor, reduce, and get down to a real number. If you get five over zero, you can also stop, but you'll, your conclusion is that your limit does not exist. Okay, first things first, even though we may be tempted to want a factor, that's not our first step, right? We're going to insert that two in. And what do we get? Yep, that's a real number, right? Nothing more to do. That's our limit. That's our answer. Part D? You told the answer. Yeah, it's the answer. Uh, zero. zero. Good. All right. We don't want to try to jump, you know, even though even though this looks like you can factor and go through those steps, we don't want to skip that first step, right? Let's see what's going on, right? It's already a real number, so we stop and we say that's our answer. Zero over four is a real number, is zero. All right, let's look at the uh, go ahead and try those practice problems and I'll show the answers if you guys have a, have a chance to try each of these. Okay. Number one, what did we get? It does not exist. It does not exist. Good. Right. Negative two over zero. We know there's a vertical asymptote. The limit doesn't exist. Dig deeper into this next week, but we know we know the big picture. We know what's we know that at least the limit doesn't exist. We don't know how the branches are behaving around that asymptote, but 
we know the big picture. Okay. Number two. Yeah, it's a real number, right? Even though you may be looking at that numerator thinking, oh, maybe I can factor that. But let's not get to that point until, until there's something that's telling us to, to go further, right? We're not going to worry about factoring unless we see a zero over zero. Right? There's no need to do additional work if the problem doesn't tell us to do it. So if it's a real number, we stop, and that's our answer. Number three, what do we get initially? Okay. Yeah. Zero. Yeah. Now, um, I want to see that work. Okay. I want to see that you're plugging in the x value and showing me that you are checking for a hole before you move on and do the factoring. Okay. So on the test or quiz, I'm looking for you to show me that you're taking that first step before you do anything else. Now. Zero over zero means, okay, that means that there's a common factor I need to find so I can remove it. There's a difference of squares in the numerator. If I have a squared minus b squared, I can break that down into a minus b times a plus b. So x squared is a perfect square. One is a perfect square. We can break them into their factored forms. Common factors up here. Remove it. What's the final step? Good. So make sure that we don't just stop here, right? We don't want to just say x minus one is the answer. We're looking for a number. So make sure that you're taking that final step, evaluating that reduced expression and getting it down to a real number. You guys fine with number four. Negative three over zero. That's a vertical asymptote. Right. And so the limit does not exist. Right. We don't want to look at this and say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and just factor and reduce. Right. There's no need to do that. Right. Yeah, that um let the initial uh, value tell you what to do. Right. Okay, number five. It's zero zero first. Yeah, zero over zero. Okay, good. So we know what we're dealing with, right? There's a hole. We're going to find common factors. We're going to reduce, reevaluate. We should be able to get down to a real number. A times C multiplies to be negative six, adds up to be one. What multiplies to be negative six and adds up to be one? A negative three and two. Three and negative two, okay. So we want that three to be a, a larger positive value so we can get down to that positive one, okay? So uh, numerator is factored. Denominator, difference of squares. So what's factored form of x squared minus nine? X plus three. Negative three over zero. Yeah. Common factors, we see what's causing that zero over zero. Okay. Remove the cause of that zero over zero and reinsert. Five, six is a real number. That's our limit. OK, 
Okay, number six. First things first. Zero, zero. Okay. You know there's a hole. You know there's a answer waiting for us, right? We don't want to ever stop here and say the limit doesn't exist, right? That's not true. The point doesn't exist, but the limit does exist. We have to work around that hole. So for now, we're going to leave the numerator alone, the denominator difference of squares. So I'm looking for common factors. I think I can do something with that 5 minus x and x minus 5, but they're not lined up perfectly. Um, is there anything that I can do to make them match better? Uh, Good. So 5 minus x and x minus 5, they're almost the same factors. They're just off by by factor of negative 1. So if I just take out a factor of negative 1 from the numerator, I can just change the sign of 5 minus x and make it negative 5 plus x. Now, if you look, negative 5 plus x, that's the same thing as x minus 5. It's just the numbers, the values are rearranged. So now we know that they match. We can remove it, but we kept, tr kept track of what's um, what adjustment we made, right? That negative one is going to stay. Now reevaluate. Five in for x. Uh, yes. But we're going to practice. Um, OK, now on the quiz or test, if this table of values, I'm going to fill in those, that table for you and then you're just going to read it. But um, we need to be able to know how to do this algebraically because that's going to take too long and we're going to do this without a calculator. So but technically, yes, we can do this with uh, with table of values. But yeah, that would that would take. We need a calculator and we need to take the time to plug in all those decimal values. Any questions here? All right, I want to give a, a, a preview into tomorrow. Uh, the same process, it's just that now we're going to be looking at problems that require a different algebraic step in order to get the, the, the holes to cancel out or get the zero over zeros to, uh, to cancel out. Okay. So if we can turn to page um, seven. They may still need to look at this. Okay, so page seven. Um, there's also this other uh, type of problem where we need to use the second, uh, this other method, which is simplifying using conjugate method. So, if there's a sum or difference of two terms in the numerator, then we multiply the numerator and denominator by the conjugate term. Okay. Now, let me first talk about um, uh, something that, what a conjugate is and something that you've seen before, maybe not in this exact form, but let me um, put this off to the side. Let's say I have 3 over 2 plus root x. So I want to just connect some, with something that maybe you've seen before. If in the past you're given a fraction and if you're asked to rationalize the denominator, what that means is find a way to get that radical to be taken out of the denominator and into the numerator. And the way you would handle this in the past is you would multiply by the conjugate. So conjugate is basically the exact same term of the, in the denominator, but the one thing that we change is the what? 
the sign in between. So the conjugate of two plus root x is going to be two minus root x. And we're going to do that to the numerator and denominator. So I'm just going to just have us uh, connect with something that we've seen before, and then we'll we'll uh, deal with uh, what we're dealing right, we're working right now. Now, if I uh, distribute everything through, okay, so the whole goal is to try to get that root x to be placed in a different location. If I distribute everything through, I get three times two, which is six minus three root x. And then the denominator, I'm going to foil everything out. I'm going to expand everything out. So distribute the two through, distribute the root x through. Every term hits every term. So two times two is four. Distribute the two through, two minus root x. Plus two root x. Finally, root x times negative root x, which is b minus x. Okay. Now we still see some radicals in the denominator, but they're about to be removed because negative two root x and two root x goes away. So this does the job of transferring that radical to the numerator. Now. We're also going to be dealing with conjugates here, but the purpose now is to rationalize the numerator. And that feels kind of strange as well. Why do we do rationalizing denominator in the past? And now we're doing rationalizing numerator now. So the reason why is because um, uh, we're trying to find a way to get the numerators and denominators to match, especially if we know that there's a hole in the graph. Okay. So um, now that you've seen this problem, we're going to let that uh, process be part of our, our, um, our example one. OK, so we see a problem here. There's a radical, but we're not going to skip the first step. Right? First step for any limit problem is what? Plug in, right? Let's see what we're dealing with first. OK, so let's insert 4 in for x, and let's gather some information to begin with. OK, so 4 plus 32 is 36. What's root 36? 6, OK. 6 minus 6 is zero. 0, and 4 minus 4 is 0. OK, good. So just like what we saw before, we know that uh, our problem is incomplete. This is not that the limit doesn't exist. The limit doesn't exist. We're just trying to find common factors that we can remove and reevaluate. So we're trying to get one of the numerator denominators to match up. Okay. If you look, the denominator, we can't do anything here, right? X minus four is as simplified as we can get. Um, we're going to have to play with this numerator here. Okay. And the goal is, and but looking at this denominator is also helpful because the only thing down here is X minus four. So we know that this X minus four must play a role in the cause of that zero over zero. So you see an X minus four here. Basically, what we want is we want an X minus four to show up above to get that to cancel out because we know that's what's happening, right? We're, we know that there must be an X minus four above, but we're not able to see it right now. So the way that we can get that radical to show up in a different way is by rationalizing it. So the whole purpose of rationalizing is not to try to get that radical to come to the bottom, it's so that the numerator will show up as something that matches with what we're trying to match with the denominator. So we're going to multiply by the conjugate. What's the conjugate of that 6 minus root x plus 32, you think? Good. Did we change the sign inside here? No, just what's between, right? We only change the sign between the two terms. The second term, we're going to leave that alone. So we're just going to make this 6 plus root x plus 32. Now, anything you do to the to one side, you got to do to the other side. Don't so don't make any change in signs here. Okay, your numerator and denominator should match exactly. Okay, we're gonna get ready to expand. 
All right, any questions so far? Are we okay with this setup? Now, we're going to foil the numerator because the hope is that the numerator will produce something that where the radical is gone and hopefully will match the denominator. Okay, so we're going to foil the numerator, but we're going to leave the denominator alone. Do not foil the denominator because this, this x minus 4 is ready for us to cancel out. We expand the denominator, we lose that x minus 4, and we're just, um, we got to work backwards back to where we came from. So leave the denominator alone and just expand the numerator. Okay, so I'm going to fold the numerator out. So distribute the six through the parentheses and distribute the radical through the parentheses. Okay, so six times six. Distribute the six through the radical. So now I'm going to work with the second radical. So distribute the negative radical through the parentheses. And then minus, what's radical times radical? Just what? Good, so the radical times radical with the same terms below, which is gonna remove the radical. So minus all over Leave the denominator alone. Okay. Now, I purposely left something out of the numerator that is that needs to be there. It's subtle. It's kind of hard to see, but I wanted us to look for what I did wrong above. Good. There needs to be a parentheses here. The reason being a negative times positive is negative. That negative needs to affect everything that comes after. Now that the radical is gone, that negative is going to end up distributing through. So it's a very hard, you know, it's easy to to uh, um, to miss that. So I want us to take the time to recognize that anything that comes after a minus, especially there's multiple terms, I got to take care of it right then and there or remind myself with a set of parentheses. Okay, good so far. All right, so our goal is hopefully the radical all goes away, and it should because the two middle terms should just cancel out, right? Got a positive six uh, root x plus 32 and a negative six x plus root 32. So that goes away cleanly. I can distribute the negative through and begin combining like terms while um, leaving the denominator alone. I don't want to try to expand that denominator. It's already the form that, that I need it to be in. Now I can take care of that negative, right? Distribute the negative through the parentheses. All right, what does the numerator reduce to be? Zero. Not quite. Four minus six. Four minus six. Okay. So eventually we're going to get a matching pair, but we may have to do a little bit more before we get there. Okay. Before we go any further, let's just let everyone catch up and make sure that you're good with every step that we've taken so far. Questions. So we're beginning to see some matching parts appear, right? Four minus x and x minus four, they're getting close, but not quite exact. So what can I do to get those two to match up? They got a negative one, okay? From either one of them. I'm just gonna take a negative one from the top. Negative four plus X and X minus four, that's a matching pair. And we knew that this was gonna happen because 
that zero over zero, we knew that we're trying to find that matching pair. We knew that it was going to show up. We just needed the appropriate steps to be able to get to that point. Right. So now that there's zero over zero, the hole has been removed. What's our final step? Plug in. Right. We can't stop here, right? We're trying to get to a number. We still need that number, that limit that we're looking for. Right. So there's still a negative one sitting above. Four plus thirty-two is root thirty-six. Plus root thirty-six. Right, six plus six. Twelve. Okay, good. At least we got a preview into this. There's homework tonight uh, for just factoring, but this is for tomorrow. But at least we got a little bit of it. Come up and get your phones. We'll finish it tomorrow and we can probably even start on uh, quiz review. Um, it's going to be similar to. Page nine, page nine and ten. That's going to kind of give you an idea. Front and back. Yeah, you too, right? 